Fuck you, little shit. Don't worry about it. Brat fucker. You're gonna get it. Brat. You're gonna get it. Fucker. What's going on? What's going on? Tell me what's going on. What's going on? Uh, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? That's the question that Larry Gopnik, the ill-fated protagonist of the Coen Brothers' dark comedy A Serious Man, keeps asking. It's a reflexive and sort of stupid question, one in response to a series of unfortunate events that seem to be tearing Larry's quiet, contented, suburban life apart without cause. First, his wife demands a divorce, then his student tries to blackmail him for a passing grade, then his neighbor infringes on his property, then his wife's lover dies and he's forced to pay for it, then his brother gets in trouble with the law and he has to pay for that too, then his chance at tenure is threatened by anonymous hate mail. He also gets into a car accident, witnesses the death of his lawyer, and is forced to pay for a record subscription even though... I didn't do anything! Being a Coen Brothers movie, each of these situations compound and unfold into one another with surgical precision, and they are each individually illustrative of their own batch of themes, which taken together sort of shape out the central message of the movie, like one of those optical illusions that demonstrate closure. Of course, there is no real closure in A Serious Man, just as there's not really a shape in the illusion. That doesn't stop Larry from seeking it, though. He wants to understand what he's done to deserve such misfortune, seemingly unaware of what the audience could see clear as day, that it's Larry's inaction his constant refrain of I haven't done anything that causes so many of his problems. Larry knows that actions have consequences, but inaction has consequences too. Instead of grappling with this fact, Larry looks for a way to interpret his suffering, seeking out the counsel of three rabbis. The first, a junior rabbi, lectures Larry on the importance of perspective. That's what it is, Larry. The second tells a convoluted parable about a dentist who finds a message in a patient's teeth that never resolves itself, illustrating the inscrutability of God's plan. And the third rabbi, the elderly, wise Rabbi Marshak, refuses to see him altogether, literalizing the heavenly silence in the face of big questions that prompted Larry's search for advice in the first place. A lot of the things that Larry hears are cliches, like the need to change your perspective. Look at the parking lot, Larry. And yet many of them are true. Of course, cliche and parable are two devices that people use to understand what's going on. And they're not the only that a serious man has to offer. Larry's son, Danny, uses music and drugs. So does their next door neighbor, Mrs. Samsky. Larry's brother uses a complex probability map of the universe called the Mentaculus. And Larry himself teaches the theories of physics and mathematics, namely an equation that seems to definitively prove the underwriting uncertainty of all things. Now, I can see that it's subtle, it's clever, but at the end of the day, is it convincing? At its core, this film questions the persuasiveness of every interpretive device by placing them side by side and showing how they fail to work together and form any kind of semblance of coherence. The Coens communicate the real dread of a world that's become unreadable. And they take this failure down to the most basic form of interpretation, the use of language. A lot of attention is paid to the language of Hebrew, an ancient language that's lost much of its force in the modern world. Indeed, even in the 1960s, young Danny Gopnik was doing exactly what I did when faced with a Torah portion to learn from my bar mitzvah. He had vinyls, I had tapes, but neither of us learned to read or understand the Hebrew. Instead, we memorize the sounds that, to us, remain gibberish. Danny can't find his place when the time comes because those symbols are as incomprehensible as the mentaculus is. And even in English, several times in the film, people are asked to repeat things or just hear them as nonsense. Mir sir, my sir. Mir sir, my sir. Mir sir, my sir. Sir. Interpretation is how we nail down the world around us. Word by word, fable by fable, equation by equation, we secure the storm of experience onto fixed points. And when these start to come undone, and unforeseen circumstances are always threatening to do that, it can be very traumatic. We, like Larry, reach for anything that can orient us. That explains the appeal of religion, yet A Serious Man documents its ever-decreasing usefulness in the modern age. Of course, this criticism of interpretive methods 
ought to make us realize that we're watching a form of interpretation, the cinematic narrative. A Serious Man, a film in which every element is ambiguous, in which cause and effect, the engine of any narrative, is willfully disregarded, suggests that film and story are plagued by the same problems as all the other devices, despite what Hollywood would have you believe. One of the most confounding things about the film is its opening prologue, a short fable filmed in a different aspect ratio about a Jewish couple in the old country who stab and maybe kill either a good Samaritan or a demon. The prologue's meaning and its relationship to the rest of the film are totally nebulous. There's just enough thematic similarity to prompt interpretation, but once you try, the only outcome can be frustration. Moving the viewer into a headspace like that is neither pretentious nor unwieldy. It's the effect of a subtle, experienced, and masterful craftsmanship. And the Coen brothers have been doing this for years. I just don't understand it. But A Serious Man is their most explicit account of a bleak but unflinching philosophy. I don't understand. One that remains skeptical about the things we believe film, story, and interpretation can do and understands that the big philosophical truths about human life are devastatingly simple. There is no God. There is no objective or cosmic purpose for us. People experience joy to varying degrees, but everybody suffers. Anyone can figure these things out with a small amount of observation, introspection, and study. And once you do, that dim feeling of disappointment will always be there. But there should also be relief. The kind of relief you can only get when putting aside questions that are really a waste of time. Because only when the reflexive and sort of stupid questions are dropped can the better questions be asked. Better questions like whether or not the mind... Hey everybody, thanks for watching. If you want to see more film analyses like these, click here and pledge to my Patreon page. Uh, as little as $1 per video, anything helps. Um, that's what keeps this channel alive. I do this full time and I really need your help to keep it going. I want to do a lot more of these and painting analyses, poem analyses, book, music, everything like that. Um, and if you want to see more before you decide to pledge, you can click right here. There is a, a playlist of all the Understanding Art series I've done so far. So thank you so much, and uh, I will see you next Wednesday.